Hi class, today we're going to be talking about diabetes and obesity, and we're going to be discussing the underlying biochemistry that it can help contribute to these very common uh, diseases. So uh, as an overview of what we're going to be covering today, we'll talk a little bit about what causes diabetes, the underlying biochemistry and the metabolic effects of the disease. And we'll be talking about it, how it's interrelated with obesity and how this uh, epidemic has been increasing over the last uh, several decades. And we'll talk about um, at least one theory for how there's a tie-in directly between the metabolic pathways we've been discussing and the obesity epidemic. So as a high-level overview, there are, um, um, uh, there's an interesting pathway here between when you eat and when these downstream biochemistry pathways that we've been learning about. And let's discuss a little bit uh, overview of how the path that food takes from your mouth into these biochemical pathways. So um, uh, the very first step that um, the sugar undergoes when it goes on this full transformation from nutrition into biochemistry is that it comes into your mouth. And there's some processing of the sugar that happens right away when the um, when you ingest carbohydrates, you're in your uh, saliva, you've got amylase, which will break down starch into these uh, smaller units. So this happens right away when, uh, when you start to uh, ingest uh, starch, chew up, uh, and chew up starch. And so there's some catabolism that happens right away. Now this doesn't continue after the starch gets into the, uh, into the, um, uh, into the stomach because the um, um, acid in the uh, in the stomach will ultimately uh, kill your amylase enzyme and deactivate it. So this this activity happens in the mouth, but it stops right away when it gets to your stomach. But then it picks up right uh, right away again when your polysaccharides transition into the small intestine. Um, and um, this happens with a variety of different enzymes. Here are a few examples of enzymes that break down disaccharides. There's a case of sucrase, which breaks down uh, sucrose into glucose and fructose. Lactase, which of course everybody's familiar with, breaks down lactose from milk into galactose and glucose. And of course, amylase, which breaks down uh, amylose uh, or amylopectin into these maltose and glucose molecules. Um, and maltase itself is the one that breaks down these disaccharides of glucose into, into glucose monomers. So all of this is happening down here in your intestines. And then the um, sugar is ultimately brought up um, through these columnar epithelial cells in your gut. Um, and they have this apical uh, uh, surface with all these villi that stick out. And the villi use this, um, uh, this uh, ATP consuming uh, a co-transport process of uh, moving in a glucose and moving it up its concentration gradient and ultimately into the blood. This is uh, ultimately enabled through uh, the sodium potassium ATPA, so it actually burns energy in order to move the glucose. And once it's in the cell, it actually will be transported directly out via glu uh, GLUT2. We'll be talking a little bit more about these glucose transporters in a bit. Um, so ultimately, this uh, sugars get your blood, and uh, many of them will then end up in your liver, where they can be uh, further processed or converted into other uh, central carbon and intermediates. Now, one of the things uh, that we haven't really thought about yet in this class to date is how sugars actually make it into your cells. And there are a variety of uh, transporters, carbohydrate transporters that make that possible. These were um, ordered and uh, uh, are named in order of their discovery here, with GLUT1 being the very first one. GLUT1 is um, present in red blood cells, and it has um, uh, the property that it moves glucose in and out of the cells uh, according to this concentration gradient. So this uh, just uh, and, uh, more or less allows glucose to equilibrate across the cell membranes. Very important thing about um, uh, GLUT1 and some of these other transporters we'll talk about is that the, this one is uh, functions independently of insulin. And we'll say that's not true of all of the glucose transporters. Some of them actually require insulin to function. So let's go through a couple others here as we, since we're talking about this. Um, GLUT2 is found in the liver, pancreas, small intestine. It's also is in, uh, insulin independent and it's very high affinity, uh, or I'm sorry, very low affinity, but high CAM uh, for, uh, for glucose. 
Glute three, on the other hand, which is the one you find in your brain, um, neurons, and sperm, uh, is, is also insulin, insulin independent, but is a high affinity transporter, uh, i.e. a low KM uh, transporter. So this arrangement allows, um, you know, your, your brain to get priority for picking up glucose. Um, um, and then, uh, but, you know, allows uh, liver to process um, uh, extra glucose when this comes in and access. So in, uh, there's a final um, uh, glucose transporter we're going to talk about, GLUT4. This one's very uh, relevant to today's discussion because it's insulin dependent. So it actually requires the presence of insulin uh, to function. Uh, this is one that we find in the skeletal muscle, the adipose tissue, and the heart. We'll talk a little bit more about how this insulin dependence works and those mechanisms in a few, in a few additional slides. So uh, before we get there, though, let's talk a little bit about how other molecules enter uh, into glycolysis. Now, these uh, different sugars have um, some of their own transporters, and some are shared with uh, the glucose transporter. Um, but let's talk about after they've gotten inside the cell, what happens? Well, many of them are follow biochemistry pathways that ultimately connect them with glycolysis and other central carbon metabolism. For example, of course, glucose just going to ride into the pathways that we've learned about, and galactose is only um, a couple of steps away. It comes in, becomes glucose, uh, galactose one phosphate, due to the action of this galactic kinase, and then there's this uh, galactose one uridyl transferase that ultimately makes converts it into this glucose one phosphate, um, and in the process, there's this epimerization reaction, um, a reciprocal or, uh, uh, epimerization reaction that interconverts a UDP glucose and UDP galactose. Uh, once you get that glucose one phosphate in, phosphoglucomutase will turn it into glucose six phosphate, and that can enter the rest of glycolysis. Um, or it can also be just um, uh, broken back down and secreted back into the blood as glucose. Fructose, on the other hand, has a, follows a somewhat different pathway. It comes in, fructokinase is what puts the extra phosphate on it, makes this uh, fructose one phosphate. And then aldolase, the same enzyme that we find in glycolysis, can actually work on this substrate and then cleave it off into dihydroxyacetone phosphate and glyceraldehyde. And now notice this doesn't have the phosphate on it. So in order to enter it into glycolysis, it is actually phosphorylated by this triose kinase enzyme, which ultimately makes, makes glyceraldehyde through phosphate. So all of these um, uh, flow of molecules throughout the body are under very substantial hormonal control. We've talked about a number of these enzymes um, around a number of these hormones over the class, of course, the last several lectures. But today, let's talk in more detail about how insulin and glucagon work and how, um, and how they influence um, the regulation of blood glucose in the blood. We'll also uh, talk more about uh, leptin here in this as we move into this discussion of obesity. So as a, a very high level overview, um, um, blood glucose uh, is, needs to be tightly regulated and it's regulated through the coordination of things that you eat and your digestion of, uh, of the sugars throughout your body, but also through the coordinated action between the pancreas and the liver that are mediated through glucagon and insulin. Now, insulin and glucagon are both peptide hormones that are synthesized in this area, specialized little parts of the pancreas called the islets of Langerhorn. Now, these islets of Langerhorn, they kind of look like these little, you know, little uh, clumps of cells or balls of cells inside the uh, pancreas. And inside them, you have a variety of different cell types. You have these alpha, beta, and delta cells. And each of those cells has its own defined function. The beta cells are the ones that make insulin. And uh, this insulin is then used to signal high glucose. Glucagon for, is made by the alpha cells and it is used to signal low glucose to the body. And what happens is that these two hormones are then uh, undergo these reciprocal and periodic shifts uh, throughout the day. After eating, you get this big spike in blood glucose, which your, uh, your uh, um, pancreas uh, senses and responds to by secreting insulin. That uh, then enables the uptake of carbohydrates in the, uh, in the muscle and fat, and ultimately that drives down blood glucose throughout the body. Now, after fasting or during exercise, um, 
you have uh, the pancreatic re release of glucagon. That stimulates uh, glycogenolysis and uh, gluconeogenesis in the liver, and that ultimately brings up blood glucose levels again. So the pathway for insulin signaling um, is something we've discussed previously, and we'll um, uh, remind you here that it functions through this um, uh, insulin receptor here on the cell membrane. And then it's linked to these very complicated signaling cascades that include the MAP kinase, the TOR pathway, um, and, um, and, a, and a variety of other pathways that ultimately uh, modulate a lot of you know, your cell's physiology, including protein biosynthesis and glycogen metabolism and uh, other uh, central carbon metabolic uh, activities. One of the things though that it does is really important in the context of whole body physiology is that it actually stimulates the translocation of GLUT4 to the cell membrane. And GLUT4 lives in these vesicles. And when uh, insulin binds to, uh, uh, to the insulin receptor and triggers this insulin receptor substrate uh, cascade, PI3 kinase, et cetera, you eventually get um, uh, you eventually get the translocation of these vesicles to the cell membrane. And when it does, like the, um, there's a really remarkable shift in your body's capacity to take up glucose from the blood. Uh, without the insulin receptor, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, without the glucose transport on cell membranes, the muscle and the adipocytes, and the glucose really can't get into the cells. But when the presence of insulin and uh, all these um, vesicles get recruited and they can, they can really substantially bring down blood glucose levels, and that's what allows your um, muscles and, uh, and fat to start bringing in and storing these molecules. Now, this isn't the only thing that happens inside your cell in response to, um, to insulin. Um, other things are also triggered in response to an insulin receptor. You know, here are just a few examples of things we've talked about previously and things that we'll discuss in more detail later in the course. Uh, but, uh, you know, the insulin binding here activates a whole bunch of pathways, and this uh, ultimately allows um, uh, you know, of course, the glucose transporters to move the membranes, but uh, it also allows uh, glyco uh, 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 glycogenesis, um, uh, glycolysis, and fatty acid synthesis. So glucagon has the exact opposite effect um, uh, in, in a physiological sense. It, it drives up the blood glucose levels, and it does this through this signaling cascade. So glucagon, and as a reminder, also um, adrenaline, will bind to this um, uh, G protein couple receptor and uh, ultimately this leads to the uh, activation of cyclic AMP, which is a uh, signaling molecule inside the cell, a very potent one. Um, this happens through adenylate cyclase that, that triggers this big phosphorylation cascade, um, primarily driven through protein kinase A. Now, we um, already studied extensively how this uh, um, modulates glycogen uh, metabolism uh, with glycogenesis uh, being activated and um, glycogen synthesis uh, inactivated. Um, but uh, uh, it has the net effect in the, in the rest of the body of mobilizing glucose from stores in the liver and uh, allowing this to be secreted out to the blood. So what happens in the case of diabetes? <clears throat> diabetes is, um, um, occurs when these signaling pathways get disrupted. And um, in the case of, um, in the case of um, um, uh, type one diabetes, there's sort of three types of diabetes that, that uh, can occur. One is type one diabetes, which is an autoimmune disease. And it uh, occurs when the, pancreas just can't make insulin anymore. There's uh, type 2 diabetes. This happens when the body stops responding properly to insulin, and we'll talk about how that occurs. And there's a third type here, which is gestational diabetes. It's also like type uh, 2 in that it, um, uh, in that it, uh, the body stops responding to uh, insulin, but it's a transient effect that occurs during pregnancy. So in type 1 diabetes, um, uh, as, a, as, a, um, as a reminder here, all these 
uh, cells that are producing insulin live in these islets of Langerhorn, and it's the uptake of glucose in, uh, into those cells that ultimately triggers insulin and allows you to bring up glucose in the muscle fibers. So what happens in the case of type 1 diabetics is that they, their immune system starts attacking their um, beta cells. And as a result, you know, um, normally you would have this distribution of alpha, beta, and delta cells. Well, in a type 1 diabetic, you know, the body destroys those beta cells and you end up with just alpha and delta cells. Um, and in the case of type 2 diabetes, uh, this is something that actually uh, progresses over time. And so what happens is that um, it's always linked, uh, it's almost always linked to obesity. Um, and, uh, and what happens is as you become, um, as people become more and more obese, they become more and more insulin resistant. And the reason for that is uh, multifold. Um, but the, um, um, the, the, uh, the ultimate underlying reason is that fat tissue or adipocytes or um, adipose uh, tissue is a, um, it's an endocrine organ. And as people become more and more filled with this uh, organ, it, uh, it starts to modulate your whole body physiology. And one of those primary things that happens as a result of that is that um, your body becomes less and less sensitive to insulin that's being produced. So what happens is that your body has to um, respond to that to bring up glucose. And it does that by increasing production inside the pancreas. And so as you become more, uh, more obese, your body becomes less able to respond to insulin, your pancreas has to respond more and more. And then there's a cycle that ultimately drives itself up and up and up with your body becoming less and less sensitive to insulin and your pancreas responding more and more and more. And eventually what will happen is that um, your, um, your body will ultimately give up the ghost and the, pan and the pancreas will ultimately stop uh, responding to, um, um, to these increased demands and the cells will die and this is called decomposition. And at that time you, you can have very severe um, diabetes. So the progression of that whole process looks a little bit like this. So lean people have very low insulin resistance and obese people have very high insulin resistance. And, um, and then the insulin required in, in the body tracks along with those resistance profiles. Now, your body can keep up for a little while with that in increased insulin production up to a certain point, but at some point, that insulin, uh, those, um, uh, those demands ultimately uh, outstrip the pancreas' ability to support them, and you start to decompensate. And at that time, blood glucose goes from being maintained at normal into this um, diabetic phase where you get increasingly higher levels of blood glucose. So insulin resistance is uh, um, intimately tied to obesity. Uh, as it turns out, there are um, quite a number of mechanisms that are happening uh, related to obesity that ultimately contribute to this uh, insulin resistance. Um, so, uh, you know, some of them, just a, a few examples of these is that, you know, the skeletal muscles, um, uh, as, as we become uh, more and more obese, start to uptake free fatty acids. Um, and they start to have more ER stress and more macrophage recruitment. And um, similar things happen in the adipocytes where there's uh, hypertrophy, uh, hypertrophy in, in the uh, adipocytes and macrophage recruitment and increased cytokine production um, um, and uh, also ER stress. Similarly, in the, uh, in the liver cells, there's uh, uh, increased liver content in the, in the uh, um, or increased uh, lipid content in the liver um, and uh, ER stress and cytokine production. So the, the net summary of this is that obesity triggers something that looks like a systemic um, inflammatory response. You know, your body always thinks that it's fighting some kind of big inflammation or fighting some big um, battle. And um, this is part of what's contributing to the insulin resistance. Now, in a normal person, uh, after you have, a, you know, if you follow blood glucose over the course of a um, day, their blood glucose will look something like this, where they'll eat a meal and it'll go up, and then uh, insulin will spike and that will come back down. And then they'll eat a meal 
and then insulin will spike and the, the blood glucose will come back down, et cetera, et cetera. So the insulin is going up in these up and down waves and those are being responded. Uh, those are you know, happening in real time according to what you eat and maintaining your blood glucose until into a fairly narrow range. Now, in the case of diabetics and pre-diabetics, um, the blood glucose has some very different kinetics. After a, a blood meal, they have this massive spike in blood glucose, and it can take a very, very long time for that blood glucose to be brought up and processed. You can also start to see this here in these pre-diabetes phase of people too, as well, uh, in, in type 1 diabetics, or sorry, type 2 diabetics. So these... Um, very high levels of blood glucose are ultimately one of the major causes of problems in the body. They can lead to glycosylation of proteins in the eyes and uh, peripheral tissues and neurons, et cetera. And uh, those ultimately cause many of the secondary effects of diabetes, the health problems that are associated with diabetes. But the, the changes in blood glucose aren't the only thing that are going on. This disruption in the insulin signaling also messes up all these delicate signaling cascades that we've talked about that are associated with insulin. So when you don't have this insulin receptor um, or the signaling between the insulin and the insulin receptor is disrupted, um, then uh, you don't get recruitment of the GLUT4 um, uh, to the membrane. That's one of the things that contributes to this sort of um, long-term problem in bringing up glucose. You also disrupt all of these metabolic pathways that we've discussed that are regulating glycogenesis and glycogenolysis. Um, and this creates um, an issue, which is that normally your body would be receiving in, uh, signals from both glucagon and insulin, and they would be having some um, balancing effects on one another. But when you remove all the insulin signaling, your body believes that it's in a constant state of starvation. And even though your blood is filled with glucose, your body spends all of its time trying to uh, behave as if it were starved for glucose because it, it hasn't gotten the signal, it doesn't have the message. And so the result is that your body is um, constantly uh, inhibiting glycolysis, activating gluconeogenesis, activating protein catabolism, activating uh, um, um, uh, these, these pathways that just aren't appropriate for a high glucose state. So um, this ultimately results in a major substrate overload in the liver um, and all kinds of things start to happen. You get this accelerated degradation of proteins in the, in the, in the periphery and accelerated de degradation of fats. All these things end up in is either lipoproteins or um, free fatty acids that come into the liver. And there's also this really significant production of ketone bodies, which are these starvation fuels that we learned about earlier. This acetyl-CoA, um, you, can, um, um, you can be carboxylated by acetyl-CoA carboxylase, and that really leads to this family of ketone bodies that we learned about earlier that are um, sort of starvation fuel for your brain and some of the other parts of your body. So diabetics, even though they are swimming in glucose, have a body that is producing ketone bodies. So all of these effects um, add up to have some significant health impacts. You know, over time, uh, unmanaged diabetes will result in renal failure, stroke, blindness, nerve damage. It's one of the leading causes of amputation. Um, it's a major contributor to heart disease, and, um, and it reduces people's life expectancy. It's like one of the sixth, sixth uh, most uh, leading cause of death. And uh, it's, a, it's a death rate that's increasing um, uh, really significantly um, over the past uh, several decades due to the other problem we're going to be talking about today, which is that obesity, which is the primary risk factor for diabetes, has increased dramatically over the last half century. So this is just a um, plot of biomass index BMI over the last, um, uh, uh, since uh, uh, 1990 here in, in the US. You can see that there's been a progressive shift between uh, lower to higher and higher levels of biomass um, uh, over this period of time. We're getting fatter. This isn't a problem that just applies to North America. It goes all the way around the world. Everywhere in the world is experiencing this shift towards obesity. And this is becoming from 
um, over nutrition. We have too many calories available to us now. We eat too much. And as a result, we're having health problems that are a direct result of that hypernutrition. So this is a direct consequence um, uh, on our life expectancy. There are currently 4 million people a year that are dying as a direct result of being obese. And um, um, uh, and this rate is going to be continue to increase uh, as our obesity rates in, uh, uh, continue to go up globally. Now, Canadians are not immune to this problem. Uh, Canadians have also been uh, getting larger over time. Uh, here's a distribution of uh, biomass index across the various provinces. With uh, in 2004, uh, um, Canada had an overall um, a percentage of people who are obese or overweight that was set at uh, 58 or almost 59% uh, uh, of, uh, of Canadians. Well, just uh, in just 13 years, um, this has gone up from 59 to 64%. They're currently, much 64% uh, uh, of Canadians fall into this category of being obese or overweight. So this is a really serious problem. It's uh, happening right here and is contributing to uh, preventable deaths. So diabetes, obesity, heart disease are part of these interrelated problems. Um, and, um, and many of them stem from this overnutrition that we, we experience here in Western societies or now all the way uh, around the world. There's been a lot of discussion about what contributes to it and uh, what are we doing um, to combat it. Now, um, one of the things that comes to mind when we talk about obesity, what's going on is people can think about, um, uh, frequently think of hormonal disruptions as being uh, related to it. And sure, thyroidism uh, can contribute to obesity. Um, and there can also be more extreme examples. In the case of leptin, for example, which is the satiety hormone, if you're missing the leptin receptor, um, you can become tremendously obese. So these are examples of a couple of different genetic lines in mice, B6 and BTPR, uh, that are either normal or have their leptin receptor knocked out. This is the OBOB -OB mice. So these guys here can't help themselves. They have no satiety signal, they never stop eating. And as a result, they get this in, enormously overweight. Um, but this isn't a condition that really is, um, uh, is, is not very frequent in the human uh, populations. And it's certainly not something that's on the rise or contributing to this uh, epidemic of diabetes. So what is? Now, one of the theories that uh, has been circulating is that fructose um, is and the use of fructose and sweeteners has been one of the things contributing to obesity. This is pretty interesting theory in the context of this course because it ties directly to these biochemistry pathways that we've been learning about. Um, so as a brief overview, uh, high fructose corn syrup was introduced in the, in the 1970s, the late 60s, early 70s, and has seen this sort of dramatic increase in the food and beverage industry. Um, uh, up, you know, up until, you know, the, the 2000s. So um, we saw this uh, at the same time, the introduction of this high, high fructose corn syrup, we also started to see a, a really dramatic rise in the rates of uh, obesity. And so there's been a lot of uh, suggestions that there may be some link between the use of the sweetener and obesity. So what exactly is uh, high fructose corn syrup? Well, it's not just one product, it's actually a range of different products that have uh, different compositions of fructose in them. So uh, HFCS uh, 90, for example, is like 90% fructose with a small composition of other things, whereas HS, uh, uh, um, HFCS uh, CS 42 has only got 42%. Um, so there's sort of this range of these different products. But in general, these high fructose uh, corn syrups have a lot more fructose in them than naturally um, um, occurring fruit sources or uh, fruit-based uh, sugars. Um, so for example, uh, table sugar that we eat is sucrose. It's a 50-50 mixture of glucose and fructose as a disaccharide. Um, you know, brown sugar is very similar. Um, you know, honey has more monomers in it. It does have a fair amount of fructose in it, um, uh, but, but not as much as, um, as high fructose corn syrup. So 
that's the you know that's the um, the epidemiology of this that was introduced, and we saw uh, obesity rising at the same timeline. But um, the biochemistry behind this and why people have been interested in discussing this and thinking about this as a potential mechanism for contributing to diabetes is the fact that um, uh, is the fact that there's some direct interaction between fructose metabolism, the way that it's uh, catabolized and the um, and the um, um, and uh, the um, and the pathways we've been talking about, the signaling pathways. So, as you recall, um, uh, the, there's this carbohydrate response element binding protein. This one of the transcriptional regulators there that tells your body that you're eating glucose and responds by turning on genes related to glucose synthesis. So the idea that um, is that by eating fructose um, rather than glucose, that you may actually be activating this pathway and, um, and stimulating the production of fatty acid synthesis genes. So the thinking behind this is that, um, is that you know, fructose can come in, it gets uh, phos uh, phosphorylated, comes in, then uh, builds up here at this sort of uh, dihydroxyacetone phosphate and these other steps here. And that these things can backflow into the pentose phosphate pathway um, via these non-oxidative reactions, ultimately leading to the production of cellulose 5-phosphate, which is the molecule that stimulates the carbohydrate response element binding protein. And that ultimately can trigger then these, um, um, you know, the, uh, the increase in fatty acid synthesis, increase in cholesterol biosynthesis, and the decrease in, um, um, in, in other kinds of um, um, lipid catabolism behavior. So the other thing that's thought about the uh, use of glucose is that, you know, the way that it comes in can directly feed the synthesis of fatty acid and triglycerides. Um, and the thought here is that, you know, it's glycerol kinase um, uh, reaction taking glycerol to glycerol, I'm um, sorry, uh, um, glyceraldehyde to glycerol. There's a dehydrogenase enzyme that converts those two molecules and a kinase that'll take glycerol to glycerol kinase, three phosphoglycerol, uh, sorry. Um, that this is a mechanism that can help provide the body, the substrate, the, uh, the, the glycerol backbone there to build these triglycerides. Um, now, I think what you should bear in mind when we discuss each of these theories is that the biochemistry behind these things isn't totally solid, and the, there's, there's, there is a fair amount that's going on uh, in the body, and so we have seen an association between uh, the use of fructose and ob obesity, but the mechanisms we're talking about here are by, by no means hammered out and, and, and known for sure. So some recently, uh, recent progress on this, actually published just in, in 2021, uh, showed that actually uh, there may be some other dimensions to this uh, obesity and linked to, to fructose than what we thought about before. One of them is that um, the consumption of fructose, as it turns out, uh, actually um, makes your uh, villi in your in, in small intestines um, uh, more um, uh, more able to transport uh, nutrients. So like the consumption of glucose actually makes your cells more permeable to other, uh, to other nutrients. So there's some emerging evidence to suggest that it, this may actually um, have multi-layered effects. And that's not just the uh, processing of glucose, or I'm sorry, fructose, but it may be that it has some effects on the cells which can actually uh, um, drive uptake of, um, of additional nutrients. So overall, these effects are either they're happening through uh, increased uptake and uh, change of permeability of the gut or through these sort of transcriptional modulation uh, levels or uh, changes in lipid biosynthesis. They're ultimately leading to this um, suppression of fatty acid degradation and activation of uh, fatty acid biosynthesis. So that's the, the overall picture here that's, um, that's emerged as a hypothesis. Now there is some arguments against this um, fructose theory. One of them is the, this, the fact that um, fructose is uh, actually made up of um, um, a molecule that we find in other kinds of sweeteners. So uh, obviously uh, uh, sucrose, 
here is a disaccharide. And when you break it down, um, and as, as we discussed in, uh, previously with these uh, enzymes that break it into the monomers, you'll end up eating uh, 50 percent fructose for every time you eat sucrose. So um, also, although there are some very high um, fructose containing corn syrups, some of them are only, you know, slightly more fructose or even lower, uh, uh, lower fructose than what we find um, in, in sucrose, which is a normal table sugar. So there are 42 to 55 percent of sort of normal compositions for high fructose corn syrup. So um, it's, it's not entirely clear why fructose um, metabolism will be really different from sucrose metabolism, given that these things are broken down into their monomers as a part of the digestion. Another argument against uh, the fructose metabolism theory contributing to obesity is that, um, is that obesity is high in all countries, sort of irrespective of their use of fructose. Like not all countries have shifted over to fructose. Now, Canada is one of those that does use it, but it doesn't use it anywhere near as much as the US. In contrast, um, Mexico has very, very high rates of, uh, um, of uh, obesity, nearly that uh, up to the US. It has a pretty modest uh, use of fructose um, uh, and so forth. So there's, uh, it's just not entirely clear what's, what the relationship here, but it doesn't seem like there's a direct correlation between the use of high fructose corn syrup and obesity. Um, and then the other argument against the fructose theory is that obesity rates have continued to, uh, to increase despite the fact that many countries have reeled back on their use of uh, high fructose corn syrup. So this has declined over the last decade, but obesity rates have continued to rise. So I think the constellation of these things seems, uh, tends to say that although fructose may be having some effects, it's certainly not the whole picture. And that's something to bear in mind that this is only one possible contributor to a variety of things that include behavioral, psychological, genetic factors, physiological factors, um, metabolic, hormonal, social, uh, economic, cultural, and environmental conditions that all contribute ultimately to obesity. So with that, we'll wrap up and just uh, remind uh, everyone that the Main take-home lessons for today are to understand what diabetes is, the different types of diabetes and what causes it, um, and how it's linked to the obesity epidemic. And then we described um, this fructose metabolism theory and how it's uh, possibly linked to the obesity epidemic, and we provided some evidence both for and against this theory. I hope uh, everybody enjoyed this lecture and uh, you just provide some insight in how these biochemical pathways that we are learning about are directly related to human health.